On August 10th, 1991, investigative journalist Danny Castellaro was found dead from an apparent suicide inside of the Martinsburg Sheridan in West Virginia. Danny had traveled to West Virginia to meet a source about a mysterious group he called the Octopus. In the weeks leading up to his death, Danny received multiple threats on his life and even warned his brother that if anything should happen to him, not to believe it was an accident. Yet only a few days later, Danny's lifeless body would be found inside of a hotel bathroom, both of his wrists deeply and repeatedly slashed. Hello and welcome to Fact and Suspicion. I'm your host, Ben. And I'm your other host, Dan. And tonight's mystery is the strange death of investigative journalist Danny Casolaro. And we should probably go ahead and tell you there's a bit of a content warning with tonight's episode. We're going to be talking a bit about self-harm, uh, suicide, and it gets it gets a little bloody and gruesome at times, though we do feel that all of these details are important to the case. Yeah, so... Uh, Ben, uh, I think we should just get started. You know, tell us some more about Danny Casalera. Who was this guy as a person? So we don't know a ton about Danny's personal life, but according to his friends, uh, friends and family, uh, he was a really outgoing, really charismatic guy. Uh, what we do know is that he had a wide array of interests. At various times in his life, he was an investigative journalist, a published author, an amateur boxer, and in his spare time, he liked to raise purebred Arabian horses. Those sound uh, pretty expensive. Uh, they are. I actually looked them up for the episode. Uh, on the cheaper end, they're around 500 but they can go for up to 50000 with the average being somewhere around 2500 So, not cheap. No, I guess he uh, had quite a bit of invested uh, money invested in those. Well, you know, he did come from money. His father was a doctor. His brother was a doctor. Now, in the mid-70s, he set aside journalism and purchased a number of computer trade magazines. Uh, and he made really good money doing that, but eventually started to miss his time as an investigative reporter. Uh, in the late 80s, he learned about the Inslaw Affair through contacts within the computer software industry and made the decision to sell his businesses and pursue a book about the story. Now, I'm going to go into detail a little later about the Inslaw Affair, but for now, it's enough to know that it's the story that led Danny down the rabbit hole he would come to call the octopus. Danny seemed to be a really interesting guy, uh, but you know his death was ruled a suicide, right? So yeah, would we even have any reason to suspect he'd want to commit suicide i mean he would be suicidal you know so it's certainly possible uh his life to be fair was in a bit of an upheaval at the time for one uh he was having some money issues he had recently sold his companies as i mentioned uh but he'd done so for less money than they were worth and according to his friends and family he was uh he was pretty upset about that i mean that that does sound like a bad decision but Oh, it was pretty impulsive, right? The, the whole decision to sell the companies and go after this uh, this story back to journalism. So it's at least understandable. Yeah, I just, I just still though, you know, money trouble like that. He he comes from a wealthy family. They're like, you think, and he has those horses, right? I mean, right. You think he'd be okay? Yeah, you certainly would. And not only does he have the horses, uh, but his home was worth several hundred thousand dollars, and his uh, both his father and brother. Uh, have uh, both said that if he needed money, that they could, that he knew he could have borrowed it from them without any issues. Though they were really skeptical of whether he was having, uh, really having money issues or not. They said that if he was concerned about money, that it would have been more long term because he still had money from the sale of his business. But either way, I think it's clear that money issues for Danny, not exactly what we would consider money issues. Okay. Yeah, so that doesn't seem like something you'd commit suicide over. I mean, I'm not, I can't say that for sure. I don't, I'm, I'm not in Danny's shoes, but. Right. I obviously. mean, it's, it's hard to say what someone would or would not, you know, commit suicide over. Right. Uh, but on top of the money issues, he was having a hard time uh, getting a publisher for his book. So uh, that could be a potential factor as well. And another thing that's usually cited is the possibility that he had MS. Uh, I say possibility because during his autopsy, uh, lesions were found on his brain that are consistent with MS. 
So we don't know if he ever had a, a formal diagnosis or not. And so, you know, we don't know if it could have impacted his, you know, his decision or not, right? If he didn't know, it couldn't really be a factor. And according to the coroner, uh, he probably wouldn't have been having symptoms at this point anyways. Right. So I also don't think that even if he had been given an MS diagnosis and he knew about it, if he wasn't even having severe symptoms, I wouldn't think that would be something he would end his life over yet either. But again, I can't say I'm not in his shoes, but it does seem strange. Right. Especially with how excited he seemed to be about this story. Right. I mean, like if you, you look through Danny's notes, like he, he thought he had put it together. Right. Yeah. Like he had, like he had found the, the unified conspiracy theory. So like, tie everything together. Right. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if these are convincing reasons for suicide. But and there's certainly factors, though, right? They, they have to be considered. Factors. Yeah. But so he he died in in Martinsburg, West Virginia, though. That's correct. So what what was he doing there exactly? So he had gone to West Virginia to meet a source with information about the Enslaw affair. Now we're not sure if he ever actually met the source, uh, but we do know that he met a man named William Turner to get documents that he intended to trade with the source for the information he needed. Uh, do we know what was in those documents? Uh, a bit. According to William Turner, at least some of the documents related to an NSA whistleblower named Alan Standorf, who had died under mysterious circumstances. But other than that, it, it's unclear. Now, do we know if he ever actually met that source? Uh, we don't. So this is actually probably a good time for me to give you just a brief timeline of the events leading up to Danny's death. So at 2.30 on the 9th, he met with William Turner in the parking lot of the Sheridan to get the documents he needed. At 5.30, he had the first of two conversations with a man named Mike Looney, who was staying in the room next to Danny's. Uh, it was described as brief and mostly just small talk. The second conversation happened at about 8 and was considerably longer. According to Looney, Danny told him he was a reporter and he was there to meet a source and he was expecting him uh, at about 9 o'clock. Now, shortly before 9, Danny excused himself to make a phone call and when he returned, he told Looney that his source might have blown him off. The two talked until about 9.30 and at 10... Danny went to get a cup of coffee from a local convenience store, and that was the last time he was seen alive. Okay, so that was the last time he was seen alive. Do, do we know what time he died? We have a rough estimate. So it's estimated he died between one and four and a half hours before he was found, and he was found the next day at about 1230. Okay, so that would mean he was found sometime between 830 and 1130 in the morning. Or excuse me, he was he died sometime between eight thirty and eleven thirty in the morning, and then he was found at twelve thirty. Yeah, that's correct, okay. roughly. And he was found by the maids. Was that what happened? Yeah. Uh, tell you what. Let me just give you a, a breakdown of the crime scene. Right. That seems like a good as good a place as any. Okay. So yeah, he was found by two members of the Sheridan cleaning staff. Uh, the scene was apparently so gruesome that one of them fainted. Uh, Danny was lying face up in the tub. Both of his wrists had been repeatedly slashed, and there was blood covering the walls and floor. Now That sounds pretty bad. It was. So inside the tub with Danny, investigators found a razor, a plastic bag, and an empty beer can. I know, it, it's strange. Now, mm. on the floor next to the tub were the shards of a broken wine glass. And near the door were two blood-soaked towels. Um, now... The blood on that side of the room was described as heavily smeared on the floor. Uh, one of the maids, uh, Barbara Bedinger, said it looked as though someone had tried to clean the blood up with the towels using their foot. You can probably see why it's understandable that it was immediately thought to be a suicide. And to add to that, there was no sign of forced entry. Uh, Danny didn't appear to have any defensive wounds. And there was a suicide note, or... I should say there was at least a note that could be interpreted as a suicide note. And I'm sure that there definitely, though, was some evidence of foul play, or at least what people expect to be evidence of foul play. Isn't that right? Uh, there was. So 
some of the first problems were noted by the family, and those concerned the suicide note itself. So let me just read that for you real quick, and then we can talk about uh, some of the issues the family had. To those I love the most, please forgive me for the worst possible thing I could have done. Most of all, I'm sorry to my son. I know deep down inside that God will let me in. So Is that all of it? <laughs> that's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> okay. I guess the, the first issue that the family had was the fact that Danny is or Danny was an atheist. So th- they thought it was really strange that he would have mentioned God. Yeah, I, I agree. If he's an atheist, I don't think he would be talking about God unless he, you know, became religious right there at the time of his death. <laughs> I guess anything can happen, right? You know, of course, there's also the fact that uh, for a published author and a, and a journalist, the, the note's really lacking in, in details, right? And really short. I would say there's no information at all in that note. It doesn't even necessarily say he's killing himself. It doesn't say why he's doing it. And I mean, isn't that sort of the purpose of a suicide note to, to sort of convey why you're doing this and try to make uh, your loved ones feel better about it maybe you would certainly think so particularly since he mentions his son right you'd think mm-hmm. he may might want to give an explanation so you know of course it, it's hard to put yourself in the mind of someone that would you know that would be in that sort of uh mental state mm-hmm. but uh the, the note does seem bizarre and the family and, and friends were really concerned with it so it, it's certainly worth mentioning beyond the suicide note uh, and I think more importantly, there's the nature of the wounds themselves, the, the depth and severity of the cuts. Uh, Danny had between 10 and 12 cuts, uh, ranging from his wrist to his elbow. Mm. It was really vicious. In fact, a par- one of the paramedics said that he had never seen such a brutal suicide and didn't know how Danny didn't pass out from the pain after the first two cuts. Some of the cuts were so deep that they'd actually gone through the tendon. Wow. Okay, so there's so many things about this. Um, I don't understand why anyone would want to put themselves through that much pain while committing suicide. I, hey, it's, I it's, would, a good, it's a good point. I would think you could make a much simpler cut. I, I shouldn't say simpler, but not as uh, not as deep and still you know, have the same effect. And you wouldn't have to cut yourself all the way up the arm. And the other thing I, I don't understand is um, if you manage to, to cut the tendons in your arm, how would you manage to keep doing the cutting? I mean, he had cuts on both arms, right? So if, how did he even manage to get yeah, the other the, arm cut? Right. The, the mechanics of that, that don't seem to really work out. And a another problem that the family had here was the fact that Danny was notoriously squeamish around blood. Uh, this was a guy that didn't even like to have his blood drawn. So they had a really hard time believing that a, that he would have committed suicide, and that B, had he chosen to, that he would have gone this route. Yeah, that's that's just, oh, I can't imagine. I cannot yeah, imagine. I mean, this was a particularly vicious suicide. I mean, suicide's always terrible, but this one was was really brutal. And that actually plays into the, the one of the next points, because um, the pathologist noted a lack of hesitation marks. Which, in case if there's anyone not familiar with those, a, a lot of times when someone is committing self-harm by cutting, they'll make smaller, more shallow cuts to begin with to gauge the pain and to get their nerve up, and then only later uh, make deeper incisions. But with Danny, he seems to have just gone straight to work, right? I can't understand in someone that had never attempted suicide before and was so squeamish around blood that there wouldn't be some sort of hesitation marks. I, there are no reports of Danny attempting to commit suicide before, are there? Uh, no. Uh, his family said that uh, he had never even um, he never even mentioned suicide before and certainly had never tried it. Uh, now, of course, the lack of hesitation marks uh, isn't necessarily you know determinative of anything. They're not always present. They're just usually present, right? Okay. Another thing that, that does seem a bit strange in my mind is how the blood was just all over the bathroom in this case. I, I'm, I'm sure there would be blood, but I can't imagine it just spraying all over the entire room that way. Doesn't that seem strange to you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good point. I mean, I, th- I suppose you could appeal to arterial spray, but even that's not particularly convincing because it seems like the, the tub or the water would have shielded some of it. But, I, you know, of course, I guess that depends on where exactly his wrists were when, it, when he cut them. I, I'm not an expert on this at all. 
I would I would imagine that he would have to have his arms outside of the tub for that to happen and and probably facing outward a bit, which seems like a strange way to be sitting, I would think. Now, interestingly, the investigators had a theory about how the blood might have gotten across the room that way. But uh, let's cover a few of the other anomalies first, and, and then we'll get to that. Though, spoiler alert, it's not particularly convincing. Well, I'd like to hear it anyway. <laughs> well, so first, you know, I mentioned that, that inside the tub with him was a bag, a beer can, and a wine glass. Or, or the sorry. wine glass was on the floor, right? Right, the, the wine glass, or the, the glass was on the floor. So there was the yeah. bag and the beer can inside the, the tub with him. Now, first point there, Danny had no alcohol in his system. So first, it seems strange that you know, there were so many alcoholic beverages laying around, uh, with especially with an empty can in the tub. Okay, so so there's definitely a beer can in the tub, and we're sure there's no alcohol in the system. They did a full talk screen and everything, right? Uh, they did. So uh, all they found were minute traces of hydrocodone and uh, tricyclic antidepressants, but no no alcohol at all. And and when I say minute, I mean that it's likely that he'd taken these days before. Though I should point out that even these talk screen results should be taken with a grain of salt. Because, interesting fact, Danny's body had already been embalmed before the autopsy. And his family wasn't consulted. In fact, they weren't even notified of his death until several days later. Okay, I'm, I don't know about state laws in West Virginia, but I'm fairly certain that it's not legal to embalm a body without the family's permission. Uh, that's my understanding as well. I, I've, uh, but no one got in trouble for it. The, the point I was going to make about the absurd theory from the investigators. So you've got the bag, the beer can, uh, the shards of glass on the floor, and then the, the blood on the other side of the, of the room, right? Okay. So this is how they explain this, or at least the theory they came up with. So Danny's in the tub. At some point, he cuts his wrist and puts the plastic bag over his head, uh, either to hasten his death or as like a backup means, right? Okay. Now, according to them, they believe that at some point he became uncomfortable with the bag on his head. And so he stood up and ripped the bag off, possibly slinging blood across the room. And shortly thereafter, he passes out or collapses from blood loss. And when he does so, he falls back into the tub and knocks over the wine glass, which they suppose was on the lip of the tub, shattering it on the floor. There are so many things wrong with that. Right. Okay, firstly, if you have cut your arm so many times and you're obviously in a lot of pain from that, why would you bother taking the bag off your head? I mean, is it because it's it's bothering you? It's uncomfortable I mean, to you and you have all these injuries already? Who would who after cutting their wrist, particularly as deeply and as viciously as he had, would be concerned about the about how comfortable the bag was, right? And why would you stand up to take it off? Another good question that don't really have an answer for. I mean, it seems like there was evidence there that they needed to explain. And so they came up with the only scenario they could imagine that would be even remotely plausible. Well, I mean, there's there's more than just that. Like, would he, with all that blood loss, would he have the strength to stand up? Would he have the balance to stand up? And you know what? Like, his tendons, his tendons were cut in his arms, right? So every time... I've been in a tub and tried to stand up from it that I can recall. I use my arms oh. to push myself up, right? God, that sounds awful. Okay, how would he even do it? I mean, that would be immensely painful if it was even possible with the tendon damage. Oh, that Oh, that, that sounds horrible. I did not need that mental image. Thanks for that. I, I, I hadn't actually, actually considered of, that, but that, yeah, that, that doesn't seem possible at all. Uh, and, I, and in their theory, he had definitely already cut his wrists. Right, he would have had to to, to get the blood the, across the, the blood room. Across the room, so I, that that theory makes absolutely no sense to me. But I mean, okay. yeah, I, I agree. That's just another item on the list. So right, so let, let's let's move on to to the next one. So there is some evidence that there may have been someone else in the room. So I mentioned the the bloody towels earlier, right. and I, I said that Barbara Berenger described it as though. Someone had tried to uh, wipe up blood in the floor, you know, with their foot. Mm -hmm. Well, who could have done that? I mean, did Danny get out of the tub after cutting his wrist, after taking the bag off, and go and try to wipe up blood inexplicably? Was that part of their theory that he, that he also went over and <laughs> They actually the don't mention up that. Uh, okay. 
but but it, it's still something that needs explaining, and it could suggest that there was someone else in the room. On top of that, there's the small issue with the fingerprints. So when the room was dusted for fingerprints, they found two sets, Danny's and one unidentified set underneath an ashtray in the room. But this was a, a hotel room, right? Yes. Obviously, the, it must have been the cleanest hotel room in history. Barbara and her friends must have been fantastic at their jobs. <laughs> I mean, the only thing I can think of is that every piece of furniture was completely covered with fabric, maybe. Right, you know, and, 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 right, and that's one of those that, at first glance, well, they didn't find anyone else's fingerprints. You know, it, it might seem to suggest that that would be evidence that it was, in fact, a suicide. But, like, you think about that for two seconds. Like, wait, why wouldn't there have been other fingerprints? This was a hotel. Right. That makes absolutely no sense. So it seems like it was wiped down. Uh, you know, that, that could be the suggestion there, right? Or they just didn't really check very well for fingerprints. I don't know. One of the two. Well, given the quality of investigation we've gotten with this one, that is absolutely a possibility worth entertaining. <laughs> okay. I, I believe that. And then something else that could relate to the possibility that someone else was in the room is the fact that a Sheridan employee actually saw a man leaving Danny's room in the same time frame that it appears that he died during. Um, she described him as a male in his 30s with an excellent suntan, wearing a fashionable t-shirt, dark slacks, and deck shoes. I cannot imagine that the police could possibly rule this a suicide when they have evidence that someone was leaving his room, an unknown person leaving his room around the time of his death. That's pretty easy when you ignore any information that's inconvenient to your uh, to your theory. I mean, it seems like they just worked backwards from the uh, from from their conclusions, right? One great example of that has to do with the uh, blood spatter analyst, a Dr. Henry Lee, a blood spatter analyst, was brought in and also concluded that it was a suicide. Mm. But here's the problem: Lee never actually saw the crime scene. Then his how did he determine that? I don't his understand. opinion was based on a photo array of the scene and a video reenactment, which, a, by a the way, the FBI refuses to turn over despite numerous FOIA requests. Okay, a video reenactment. Is that a video reenactment of the two housekeepers walking in on the scene? What's a video reenactment of what? What well, kind it, of reenactment? Well, it's a good question because we don't exactly, because we don't know what's in it. I mean, it, it seems strange because you would think that if, you know, for whatever reason you were going to make a video reenactment, you would probably base it on what the blood spanner analyst uh, had to say. Like, it doesn't seem like you would give him this video and try to bias his opinion, you know, if you cared about not biasing his opinion, right? <laughs> that makes no sense. That's, I don't understand that at all. Oh, and, and there are other problems, too. So uh, the photos that Lee was given didn't contain the bloody towels that were witnessed by Barbara Bedinger. Were they not complete photos of every inch of the room? Well, that's a good question. Maybe they didn't have the pictures, or maybe they just chose not to turn them over. Perhaps they had already decided this was a suicide and didn't want to overburden the good doctor with any extraneous information. <sighs> and, and we can be pretty confident that those towels were there, because not only did Barbara Bedinger see them, but a, a member of the cleaning crew that was brought in by the Sheridan uh, called Lay Scrub one of their employees, Ernie Harrison, was later interviewed, and he recalls throwing the towels away personally. So, my goodness, so we know the towels existed. Yeah, I mean, we can be pretty confident. And they got away? That. They weren't in an evidence bag somewhere? I know, it seems to defy reason, right? What were the towels even doing there? Obviously, it's not his fault. I mean, well, the no, towels, it seems like they shouldn't have been there anymore, because the investigation of the room was already done. Right, they wouldn't call in a cleaning crew if they needed to preserve any more evidence. That's right, the ridiculous. Sheridan had been given permission, right, to uh, to call in the cleaning crew. You know, the the police were done; they had everything they needed, and somehow they left the bloody tiles. Okay, so I'm sorry. Let me just try to straighten out these facts because I'm really <laughs> Good confused. Luck there. This, I'm really confused at this point. They brought in a blood spatter analyst. Yes, but he didn't get to see the scene of the crime. No. Okay, so in most cases I know of, you know, I've, I've looked into several true crime cases before. 
And in almost all of them, the blood spatter analyst actually visits the scene of the crime and sees the actual blood spatter instead of just seeing photos of it. Well, that that certainly, certainly seems and, reasonable, right? And I mean, you know, I used to watch Dexter a lot too, and wow. he seemed to always go to the scene of the crime. I mean, that's, right? that's as good as a medical degree there. Right, exactly, right? So um, beyond that, you would think that if he was working off photos, he would need photos of every square inch of that room. But obviously he wasn't provided that if the towels weren't in the photos. Exactly. And, you know, maybe maybe you could say that um, this was an accident or uh, you could say that, uh, that they genuinely believed that the towels were not relevant to the crime scene. But it does seem suspicious that they omitted one of the few details that could suggest the presence of another person, right? Right. That's it's ridiculous. And then they gave him a video reenactment, which... Right. That's obviously improper procedure. You can't give an analyst that's supposed to make an unbiased opinion a video showing what you think happened. Right. So. And it gets even harder to give them the benefit of the doubt because uh, Dr. Lee found out much later that these same police officers had lied to him on other occasions about other, um, about other crimes. So, you know, it's, it's really difficult to give them the benefit of the doubt here. It sounds like the entire investigation was was just a joke. It certainly seemed to be. Now, this was not the only investigation. And you may think, oh, well, that's great. This one was botched, so surely the next one's much better. Except it's not. It's arguably worse than the original. It, how could it possibly be worse than that? <laughs> well, let's get to that real quick. So the second investigation was conducted by Judge John Bua, who was appointed to investigate Danny's death by the Justice Department. Now, I'll, I'll explain later why this is the case, but for now, let's just look at some of the, the issues with it. Okay. Okay, so the first is the way they ignored the information about Danny's death threats. Okay, now, as bizarre as this might seem, the Bua report actually suggests that Danny faked the death threats he received in order to make his suicide appear to be a murder. How would he fake the death threats? Well, so here we are. The report accomplishes this by citing only a single death threat, which was received by Danny's housekeeper, Olga Makros, on the Monday before Danny's death. The idea being that Danny had already decided to kill himself and staged this call for theatrics. Uh, the report says that Macros could not recall any other specific occasions on which Mr. Casolaro received such a call, even though she was at his house nearly every day. Yet, according to the original police reports, Danny had received death threats going back months, long before he could have reasonably planned this out. Macros described one where the caller threatened to cut Danny up into pieces and feed him to sharks, like, like something out of a movie. And, and this really is just a consistent theme. They just ignore any information that does not fit the suicide narrative. Well, hang on, Ben. That seems like much more than ignoring information to me. I mean, obviously, I, you have the, the police reports from the first investigation that show that she had witnessed firsthand several of these death threats. And then the Boo report claims that she said she only saw one. Like, it's, it's an absolute lie. It's fabrication. Okay. So, to be absolutely fair to the Boo report, we don't know for certain if they had access to those police reports. Even if they didn't, it seems like they, they, they interviewed just asked her. They, they, it seems like they must have interviewed her to have the information that she says that she knows of no other. Uh, right. I, mean, I, I agree. I'm just trying to give them every possible benefit of the doubt. Just, to, okay. just to be fair. Now, where it gets much more difficult to give them the benefit of the doubt is the section about the missing briefcase. All right, so, so what's going on with the briefcase? All right, so the briefcase is one of the more intriguing mysteries surrounding Danny's death. Now, I mentioned earlier, as you'll recall, that Danny had received documents from William Turner that he intended to trade for information from his source, right? Yeah. Okay, but here's the problem. No documents were found after Danny's death. That's that's pretty weird. It is. This seems like a conundrum. But the Bua Report's solution to this is simple. No documents were found, so obviously they never existed. Now, so they're just ignoring the the word of William Turner? Not just William Turner, as it, as it happens. 
This requires them to ignore multiple credible witnesses to the contrary. First, of course, there is William Turner, who is adamant that he gave Danny documents. Then there's Danny's housekeeper, Olga, who helped him pack for the trip to West Virginia. Now, she told police that Danny left with a briefcase that was either dark brown or black, and that she asked him specifically what was in it, and that he replied, quote, all of my papers. Now, Olga said that this made sense because he had been typing for the last two days before leaving, uh, which, by the way, that, that means it's likely that Danny had at least part of his manuscript with him at the time. Mm. Then there's Barbara Bedinger, one of the two cleaning ladies who found Danny's body. She was asked by police if she noticed a briefcase or papers in Danny's room at any point. And she said that she had seen a briefcase on his desk with papers sticking out of it. So her statement corroborates not only Olga's claim that Danny had a briefcase, but the papers she saw were from the same day that William Turner claims to have given Danny documents. Yet, according to the Boer report, only one unnamed employee claims that they may have seen Danny with a briefcase. And from this, the report concludes that Danny never had a briefcase or any documents. So they're just ignoring everything that all three of these witnesses said. Well, they're at least ignoring William Turner because, again, it's difficult, but giving them the benefit of the doubt, to be absolutely fair, it's another situation where they may not have had access to those police reports. But as you said before, it seems like they still would have interviewed the people, right? You would think so. Uh, they're just, again, it looks like they started with a conclusion and just worked their way to it as best they could, even if it meant ignoring extremely credible witnesses. They either did that or did a very, very lazy investigation. Right. It's either ignorance or incompetence, right? That seems like the only two options here. Yeah, that's, that's the only thing I can think of. So, Dan, we've discussed some of the problems with Danny's death and the ensuing investigations. But to really understand why so many people believe he was murdered, you need to understand the story he was investigating at the time, the Inslaw Affair. Right, and, and this is kind of a rabbit hole, isn't it? it? It is. I would say he fell into it, but really it's, it's more like he was led into it. Uh, but, but we'll get to that in a moment. So, Inslaw was a computer software company that developed a powerful piece of software called Promise which was stolen by agents of the U.S. government. Danny initially learned about Inslaw through his contacts within the computer software industry. And sometime after he began looking into the case, he was contacted by a man named Michael Riconosciuto, who claimed that he was personally involved in the theft of promise. And more, that on behalf of the Justice Department and CIA, he had modified the software with a back door for the purposes of spying. Now, according to Riconosciuto, Promise was then sold to other countries, including Israel, Canada, and Australia, just to name a few, through a government contractor called Hadron. Now, here's the thing about Riconosciuto. He appears to be something of a pathological liar, but he gets just enough right that it's hard to write him off. So, I'm going to stick to claims that have been independently verified. And luckily, most of the Inslaw affair is really well documented thanks to the court cases and the House Judiciary investigation. So, uh, this Promise software, what exactly does that do? What, uh, what's it for? Why do they want it so bad? Okay, so Promise stands for Prosecutors Management Information System. Now, in the early 80s, government agencies had begun updating to more powerful uh, computer hardware, but their databases were still on software from the 60s and 70s. One of the major problems was the inability of various government agencies to share information. There was a Department of Justice database, an FBI database, an IRS database, and so on. So they were looking to upgrade. This is when they discovered Promise software capable of integrating all of these various databases. Now, as the name implies, it was created specifically as a case management software for prosecutors, but it was capable of creating databases for practically any purpose. 
uh, for its time, it was incredibly powerful. Its big selling point was um, was that it was capable of turning huge amounts of raw data into usable information, or as we'll see, actionable intelligence. And as luck would have it, Promise was developed with a grant from the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, or the LEAA, meaning that it was open source, or free. Okay, so I thought that Inslaw owned Promise, though. Is that not correct? So, Inslaw owned one version of Promise, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Okay, okay. So, the DOJ offered Inslaw a $9.6 million contract to install and manage the software in 20 U.S. attorney's offices across the country. Now, this was just a test run. If things went well, it would eventually be installed in the remaining 74 offices across the country. Now, to address your previous question, around this same time, Inslaw developed an upgraded 32-bit version of Promise using private funds, meaning, of course, the company owned the rights to this version of the software. Now, obviously, when the DOJ learned about this version, they wanted it, but they didn't have the rights to it because this one wasn't open source. Inslaw was actually looking to sell this one. I understand. So they were going to have to pay them for the new version and then probably have to pay them also to install it and maintain it and everything else. Well, you know, if Inslaw even wanted to sell it to them, right? I mean, it it was theirs. So here's what the government did. They discovered that Inslaw was having serious financial difficulties. And they used this information to gain access to the upgraded version of Promise. They demanded that Inslaw turn over the 32-bit version in case they were unable to fulfill their contractual obligations. The idea was, look, we're paying you nearly $10 million, and you could go bankrupt before you can complete your end of the deal. So we'd like you to install the 32-bit version, so in the event that you do go bankrupt, at least we have the better version of the software as compensation. And this seemed fair to Inslaw. All they asked in return was that the government agree that Inslaw owned the proprietary rights to the upgraded version and that the government not distribute the software beyond the bounds of the agreement. So Inslaw was saying, sure, we'll install the upgraded version as long as you recognize that we still own it and you don't distribute it. And the government agreed, with one caveat, that Inslaw could prove that the enhancements were indeed funded privately. And again, this was fine with Inslaw because they knew they could prove it. And this is where the chicanery starts. See, you may have noticed a bit of a loophole in the agreement that was made. Well, I suppose if the government, they could always just say, I don't see this as sufficient proof that this was developed with private funds. Well, I like where your head's at, and that's close. Um, Instead, they just refused to look at it, period. Once, so, they, once they got access to the upgraded promise, they just refused to even look at Inslaw's proof, much less validate it. Just stopped opening the mail? <laughs> I mean, basically, that seems to be the case. <laughs> now, when Inslaw protested, as you know, you might, the government began to withhold payment, placing an already financially unstable company near to bankruptcy. And from this point, This is when the DOJ went in for the kill. I mean, it's clear that there was a concerted effort by agents of the U.S. government to force Inslaw to sell Promise, and failing that, to destroy the company entirely. Almost everyone assigned to the deal with Inslaw by the DOJ had personal vendettas against Inslaw. For example, Lowell Jensen, the deputy attorney general at the time, had created a competing software to Promise called Daylight. The two programs competed for a number of lucrative contracts in the mid-1970s, and Promise won out. Now, Jensen hired a man named Madison Brewer to oversee the Inslaw contract. There's just one small problem there. Brewer had just been forced to resign from Inslaw for inadequate job performance. What a coincidence, right? This is ridiculous. You've got Jensen, who already has a grudge against Inslaw because they put him out of business. Now it seems that he's trying to put them out of business. He hires a guy they just fired, probably hates Inslaw even worse than Jensen does, right? 
It seems about reasonable, yeah. To, to manage the case. At the, at the least, this is a huge conflict of interest, and I can't believe the DOJ doesn't have guidelines preventing that. Well, actually, you know, it's not a conflict of interest, Daniel. And we know this because the DOJ's Office of Professional Responsibility ruled that it wasn't. I, so I just wanted to put your mind at ease there. No th- conflict of you. interest. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that they took this into consideration. Right. Okay, so the government is obviously putting the screws to Inns Law, right? Yeah. They're, they're withholding the payments, and Inns Law is in huge financial trouble. Well, magically, a representative of Hadron, which again was ran by Reagan associate Earl Bryan, placed a call to Inns Law and offered to purchase the company. When Hamilton refused, he was told that Hadron had powerful friends in the government and that he could either sell or he would be forced to sell. And he wasn't wrong. Attorney General Edwin Meese was close friends with Earl Bryan, and Meese's wife was a major investor in Hadron. Well, there's another conflict of interest. Uh, Now, I can't say for sure whether the Office of Professional Responsibility investigated that one, but my guess is it's probably not. (laughs) So, now, shortly after this, Allen & Co., a New York investment bank with business ties to Earl Bryan, helped finance a company called SCT, which then also attempted to buy Inslaw. When Hamilton again refused, SCT contacted Inslaw's customers and told them that the software company was going bankrupt, which, as you might expect, didn't do wonders for Inslaw's already failing financial situation. It's ridiculous. That has to be illegal. It seems like it, right? Now, it does. Now, after this latest effort to sabotage Inslaw's business, they file a $30 million lawsuit against the DOJ. So they'd had enough. Inslaw's attorney, Lee Ratner, came up with a really interesting strategy that actually paid off, uh, sort of. So he filed suit in bankruptcy court under the theory that the DOJ was acting as a creditor and exercising control over a debtor's property which is illegal, the debtor being Inslaw and the property, the promise software itself. I can see that. That makes sense to file it that way. Uh, it, it does seem to, and uh, Ratner claimed for years that it was, in fact, a legitimate use of the code. But we'll get to whether that's the case or not in a minute. So Judge George Basin heard the case, and he found in favor of Inslaw. In his opinion, he said that the DOJ had stolen promise and attempted to bankrupt Inslaw through, quote, trickery, fraud, and deceit. His ruling relied on testimony from justice officials and internal documents outlining the plot. He ended up awarding Inslaw $6.8 million in damages. Uh, Basin even accused justice officials of lying in court. Now, being a bankruptcy judge, he couldn't bring perjury charges but recommended to several congressional panels that they conduct an inquiry. So the DOJ appealed, obviously, and a federal district judge upheld the ruling, claiming that there was convincing evidence supporting the bankruptcy court's findings. However, eventually the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the ruling on the grounds that the bankruptcy court lacked jurisdiction. But things soon got even worse for Ensaw. You see, During the court battles with the DOJ, the IRS got into the show and began repeatedly auditing the company. The agency even requested that Judge Basin liquidate Inslaw, but Basin ruled against them. For this, and for his previous ruling, Basin was punished. His reappointment to the bench, thought to be a foregone conclusion, was blocked and he was replaced with S. Martin Teal, who, by the way, was the very IRS lawyer who had requested that Inslaw be liquidated. That's insane. What happened? Did the DOJ offer to cut the IRS in or something? Who knows? I mean, officials from across the government seemed to have it out for Inslaw, and the House Judiciary Committee, as we're about to get into, found that very thing. So there actually was a House Judiciary Committee investigation into this. Yes. So Jack Brooks, 
uh, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, ended up launching a three-year investigation into the Enslaw Affair. Now, let me just read you a little bit from the committee's report, okay? Mm -hmm. Quote, Actions against Enslaw were implemented through the project manager, Brick Brewer, from the beginning of the contract and under the direction of high-level Justice Department officials. The evidence demonstrates that high-level department officials deliberately ignored Enslaw's proprietary rights and misappropriated its promised software for use at locations not covered under contract with the company. It goes on to say that, quote, several individuals testified under oath that Enslaw's promised software was stolen and distributed internationally in order to provide financial gain and to further intelligence and foreign policy objectives. Wow. Those findings seem pretty damning to me. Uh, they, they, they are. Okay, so after the committee came to these conclusions, does that mean that Enslaw finally got some financial reparations for all this? Unfortunately, no. So, as you'll recall, their, their ruling in bankruptcy court was eventually overturned, and then the Supreme Court refused to hear the case. But before we get to the rest of that answer, I'd like to read to you a quick list of the crimes that the committee found were likely committed by high-level justice officials and private individuals. Let's hear it. Okay. Conspiracy to commit an offense. Fraud. Wire fraud. Obstruction of proceedings before departments, agencies, and committees. Tampering with a witness. Retaliation against a witness. Perjury. Interference with commerce by threats or violence. Racketeer, influenced and corrupt organizations violations, or RICO. Transportation of stolen goods, securities, and monies. Receiving stolen goods. Well, the DOJ would think they'd know better than all that. I mean, just a small <laughs> list of infractions. Wow. But now more to answer your question about whether they received compensation. The report did, in fact, ask now Attorney General William Barr to, quote, immediately settle Enslaw's claims in a fair and equitable manner and recommended that he appoint an independent counsel to fully investigate the matter. And yes, that is the current William Barr, because he was also AG under George Bush. Now, Barr refused, and instead appointed retired Judge Nicholas Bua, who was to report directly to William Barr. And this is the origin of the second investigation into Danny's death. So its quality isn't exactly surprising. I mean, the DOJ was investigating itself. And this is also why, of course, Enslaw never got the money they were owed. Obviously, the DOJ doesn't want to point the finger at themselves. Well, yes, that's why they didn't appoint an independent counsel. Instead, got a retired judge who was to report directly to William Barr. Such a joke. It really is. Didn't you mention that version of promise was sold to other countries. Yes. What, what happened with that? Like, do we, are we sure that happened? Yeah, we can be, we can be pretty certain, I'd say. So let's begin with Israel. Okay, so there's the story of Dr. Ben Orr, for starters. In February of 1983, Dr. Ben Orr attended an Enslaw presentation for the 32-bit version of Promise. He claimed to be a public prosecutor from Israel and was really impressed with the software. He was certain Israel would purchase it and told Enslaw to expect a call. Well, the call never came, and Dr. Orr was never heard from again. And there's a good reason for that, as it turns out. You see, Dr. Ben Orr never existed. In reality, he was Raphael Eaton, head of Israeli counterterrorism. And records discovered during the House Judiciary Committee investigation show that a Dr. Ben Orr left the Justice Department with a copy of Promise just two months after that Enslaw presentation. That seems like pretty solid evidence to me. It's pretty firm. Now, to be perfectly fair, right, both the Justice Department and Israel maintain that this was the LEAA version, right, the, the free version, right? Okay. But... According to a former Israeli spy, Ari Ben-Manashi, it was certainly the updated version. 
He claims to have attended a presentation of the software in Tel Aviv, but it wasn't Enslaw doing the presenting. Rather, it was Earl W. Bryan, again, the head of Hadron, which of course corroborates what Reconosciuto originally told Danny. And it makes sense because this was the same company trying to force Enslaw into selling. Now, so you might say, well, can we trust Ari Ben Menashe? One piece of evidence that suggests that we should, not only does he corroborate what Reconosciuto said, but he was also the whistleblower for the scandal that we would come to call the Iran-Contra affair. Wow. Oh, uh, yeah, and he also worked directly under Raphael Eaton. Seems pretty credible to me. Yeah, I mean, he was absolutely in a position to, uh, to know what was happening. I mean, I think we have every reason to trust him. I would say so as well. Okay, so that, that's Israel. I'd say there's pretty solid evidence that Israel had this software, right? And then, of course, there's Canada. And this is actually my favorite story. So Canada claims, of course, like every other government in this scenario, that they never had the software. In fact, Canada says they never had either version, which makes it really bizarre that they sent two letters to Enslaw requesting extensive manuals on the promised software. So how do they explain sending the letters? Well, the official explanation is that it was an accident. I mean, how that makes any sense, I have no idea. So they sent a letter asking for a manual on a piece of software they never had. That's correct. Well, you know, according to Canada, anyways. I mean, maybe Canada just doesn't lie enough to be any good at it. I don't know. (laughs) We need to take some lessons from U.S. intelligence, I think. Right. So that's basically the entire Enslaw debacle. Now, there are other bits of information. In fact, there are entire rabbit holes you can fall into. But the, this is the information that has been pretty thoroughly documented. Well, it seems to me, with just the hard evidence we've presented here, it's very evident that the DOJ cheated Enns Law, tried to put him out of business, and stole their software. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's just about incontestable. Not only did a judge find that another judge agreed with it and then there was the house judiciary committee uh, report also found that so yeah i mean i think that's pretty solid and it seems to go pretty deep i mean it, it went at least as deep t- as to meese right i mean because his wife was a major investor in hadron exactly so he had to be involved and he was really good friends with earl w Bryan. so exactly and then the next attorney general uh, bar right it, at least tried to cover it up i mean yeah and that, that's that's one of the really sad parts about this case right because you know Enslaw was getting nowhere while meese was attorney general and partially they were hoping that with the next administration that you know maybe they would finally get justice and then of course they ran into william Barr. yeah i mean that's <laughs> wrong attorney general for wrong that. attorney general just you come to the wrong place my friend if you're looking for justice and it's just it's it's just a real shame because it, they were waiting on the next on the next Justice Department, and then they got that one. So, I mean, the, the Justice Department clearly had no no intention of ever admitting guilt or finding fault. They just wanted it to go away, and eventually it seems to have. I mean, there's no chance that Enzal will ever get the money they were owed now. No, and I can see why someone would kill Danny Castellero over this. I mean, this this goes deep. Right, it, and this is just the stuff that we can safely say is is demonstrated, right? I mean, yes. if, if even half of the stuff that uh, Michael Reconosciuto says happened, then it, it's would be on question that he was murdered. Right. But this in itself, this, this entire Enzo affair, is more than enough, I would say, to get someone off. I would think so, too. I mean, the Attorney General doesn't want accusations like that pointed against him. I know. Right. So, so now we have the entire story. So I guess the question is, was Danny killed or did he commit suicide? I can understand an argument for him committing suicide. Same. I suppose if he felt like his story wasn't going anywhere, he felt desperate about it. He had money trouble. Maybe he knew he had MS at the time. Right. Those are reasons that I can understand 
someone committing suicide. Definitely. And then, you know, maybe when uh, when he thought that his source had blown him off, that was just the last straw, right? I can see that, but I really don't think that was the case. There's just too much evidence against suicide for me. I tend to think so as well. Like you, I can, I think there is a plausible case for suicide. I mean, just in the circumstances of Danny's life at the time, right? But there's so much that seems to contradict it that it's, it's hard to conclude that that was the case. If I had to say, I, I'm not really certain, but I lean towards him having been murdered. I almost feel like maybe it was his source that actually murdered him. That would make the most sense, right? You know, his right. source didn't blow him off. He met him. That would explain why the documents were gone. And it would explain, or it might explain, who the uh, employee saw leaving his room. Well, and it would also explain, you know, as to how someone got into Danny's room to start with. Yeah, of course. Why, why there was no forced entry. Right. Beyond all that, I just, the murder scene itself, the amount of blood, the crazy thing with the plastic bag. And the absurd theory that the investigators had. I know. It, it almost seems like they were told that they had to rule it a suicide, so they had to come up with some crazy idea. Right. So, at the very least, it seems like the investigators reached an initial conclusion and refused to back away from it, right? That they only paid attention to evidence that supported that claim, like just serious confirmation bias. And that is being charitable. And I agree. I feel like this was more than the confirmation bias. But I've got to say, in several of the cases that we've looked into and discussed together, that seems to be a recurring theme with with the police. There's a lot of confirmation bias. They find a theory and they don't want to steer away from it. Uh, that does seem to be common, right? And at some point, it just gets harder and harder to, to continue to give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, I think what we have to keep in mind is these are drastically different cases across across different times involving different officers in different locations. So it, it's easy, for, I think, for us to do to read a bunch about a bunch of disparate cases and find a lot of issues and then just, you know, get exasperated with the police. But, you know, I think we have to bear that in mind, right? That these, these cases are separated by years and miles. That's true. And even if the police... <laughs> Even if I'm giving the police the benefit of the doubt that they're just being lazy, I'm not giving the DOG the benefit of the doubt. Excuse me, the DOJ the benefit of the doubt here. Oh, oh no! Starting with Mies, his wife is an investor in Hadron. His assist, or his deputy attorney general, had a competing software against Promise and Lost, and then he appoints Madison Brewer, who was a disgruntled employee. I mean, there's no way to give them the benefit of the doubt. They were clearly no. out to get Inslaw. Definitely. And I think there's no way that the Bua report's botched investigation was just laziness. He had to have been under orders for what he was going to find. I mean, I, I tend to think so as well. I mean, why would, why would he be under orders to report directly to William Barr? Why would William Barr ignore the recommendations of the House Judiciary Committee? It's hard to come up with, with reasonable answers to these things, right? I don't I don't see one other than the fact that they just want to keep it covered up. I mean, nobody wants to think, you know, that there's government corruption. But I mean, I think that's just a pop dream that the alternative. Right? And I'm going to say, I think there is a great deal of evidence that Danny Castellaro was murdered, maybe just for this ends law affair. I think that's enough to get him murdered. Right, right. So even if you ignore everything else, like right. ends law in itself is enough. Though I do find just the all the craziness in the case to be compelling to believe there was something more to this octopus. No, I, I do too. And I would suggest that anybody interested do further reading. Because a lot of what we know that, that I didn't cover here uh, is information that was provided by like former spies. There, There's a Vanity Fair piece that discusses a lot of this. A Wired magazine piece that covers some. There's a lot of really good sources out there that discuss some claims that were made by, like, say, anonymous intel intelligence officials. And if that stuff is true, I would have no problems at all believing Danny was off. No. And I but, this en but this is enough, uh, as just about every journalist who looked into it concluded. 
you know, they didn't know whether Danny was killed. But one thing they all mentioned, it seems like, is that this case in itself, if there was nothing else for the octopus, was enough to drive someone insane right, or to get them murdered. I, I agree. I'm going to say I cannot say for certain that Danny Castellaro was murdered by right. the evidence. It's impossible to rule out suicide. But I really think he was murdered. Same. I, I, I tend to agree. You know, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt, but at some point, they just make it almost impossible. Well, Dan, I, I guess that just about covers it all then, right? I anything think so. Else, anything else you want to add? Any other questions? I, I think we've answered all the questions that I have. All right. I guess that just about covers it then. All right. Well, folks, thank you for listening to the first episode of Fact and Suspicion. And we hope you continue listening.